let it be from your heart. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We're getting ready to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. If there's something you need to give to the Lord, let's praise the Lamb. another hallelujah yes lord in jesus name yes lord my heart will sing hallelujah yes lord glory come on church sing it choir come on sing it things only you can do there's things only God can do I'm feeling so much better this week last week you know I had an emotional breakdown I appreciate all the prayers the support was was overwhelming amen I would say that you're probably stuck with me for a long time amen I appreciate you so I am praying for a young minister, amen, that I could be here for a long time. But let me tell you, I'm thinking if the Lord, if the adversary is fighting my family in the way that he's been doing, what is he doing to yours? I'm telling you, he doesn't like you either. <laughs> but I'm telling you, as much as you support me, I support you, amen. And I know what the adversary, the pressures of your job and different things that comes against all of us. Sister Holly, amen. Her family has been under pressure. Her mom and her dad, and I have ministers. I had a young minister here Sunday came after service that's moving into Lafayette. He says, Pastor Mesh, I know what you're going through. My dad's a pastor for 30-something years too, and his, my whole family, it, it's like the adversary. But you know, that's one of the signs of the last day. In the last day, the devil knows he has but a short time so he's going to fight. And I'm telling you, I'm not just speaking for my family. I'm telling you, every married couple here today, your marriage is under attack. And, you, and I know that. And you come here oftentimes like myself, and we put on a great, well, we're supposed to be strong for God. And we don't, it's supposed to show a sign of weakness. And But yet, when, sometimes when we do get our emotion, that's not a sign of weakness, that's, a sign of reality amen and I'm, I'm glad that I'm at a place that I can be real and you could feel my hurts and understand that hey, it's not a sign of weakness it's a sign of a pressure amen but I appreciate your support to, and, I, and I feel great and I feel wonderful but I know if I'm going through that I know there's a lot of you amen so I encourage every husband every wife everyone that's dating and 
your relationship. I know the adversary is going to try to break that, especially if you made a decree to do something God, good for God. Amen. The adversary is fighting, but I'm telling you, you stick with the church. Amen. And your families that have children. Amen. Your children are dependent on you. Amen. Our grandchildren. Amen. Look what we did this morning. Ten these young people sing. Amen. Amen. It's going to get good. It's going to. Amen. We're not giving the adversary a benefit. Amen. We're going to keep on marching on for Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I thank you. Amen. Christian Life Center is a wonderful church. It's a growing church. Amen. It's a prosperous church. It's a wonderful God. Hallelujah. We serve. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you can be seated. And I'm going to have Brother Mark come up. But uh, Brother Joe Donahue, if Brother Joe would come here. Amen. Up front here with my ushers. Amen. <clears throat> All the ushers there. Our ushers there. If you come. Look. About a few weeks ago, we came up with, I handed out 52 slips and we got a prayer for every week, amen, of this year. Brother Joe is going to be from 9 o'clock, amen, for the, from 9 o'clock, amen. He's going to be going through these prayers every week, amen. Every week there's a separate prayer. These prayers are from the heart of Christian Life Center. We put a booklet together, amen. So uh, I think I got 150 right now. It should be enough for every family, amen. So take at least one for every family, share it, amen. It's all the prayers of CLC that you have put together and they are, they are, they're from week one to where we at now and it just goes Lord help me re relate better to my spouse and others around me uh, Lord help me respect the needs of others and love them as Christ so it just goes Lord help me be released my faults my bad thoughts my deeds every week would be something Lord help me Lord help me restore my godly values principles of my life so that my family and the world may be restored in your love and peace. And these are just the heartbeat of Christian Life Center. I love it. Amen. It's well, it's, it's well worth every family having one of these. Amen. And every week, if you will, whatever week it is of this year, take one. If you're not a member of Christian Life Center, take one. It's from us. Amen. It's our heartbeat. And every week, I'd like you to take one, whatever week it is, and put that as a family prayer. Can we do that? Amen. I think it will give us revival in our families and in our church, our community. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for as they hand out these things, Lord, I pray you're anointed. Thank for all those that have contributed to this great prayer revival. Amen. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Pass them out there, brethren. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> With that being said, Brother Mark Hill. Amen. Brother Mark Hill. Come on up here, brother. Amen. Brother Mark doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. Been working with us here. And um, <clears throat> I don't know about you. I know a lot of you love me, and I, and I, and I appreciate your support. But uh, Brother Mark was down, and uh, I've been taking a couple of little breathers in between the ministry. I was telling Brother Mark, I don't care. I mean, this is the way I see things. I don't know who's your favorite artist maybe in the musical industry or whatever. Amen. Elvis, if he was still alive, maybe he would, they would he'd fill the house every weekend, no doubt. Hallelujah. But every weekend, if you hear the same artist, eventually, it, it, it's just, eventually you'd say, I'd want to I'd want to hear somebody else. So I take advantage of other ministers that do come through here at times. Amen. Uh, and I know you love me, and, and Brother Darrell, good to see you and your family. I just love so many of you with all my heart, everything. Uh, but it means a lot to the ears of you, believe me. It means a lot to you whenever someone else gifted has come through. They were to share the word of the Lord. I thank Brother Mark, amen, for being over this Sunday. He was over, and he said, Pastor Mitch, I said, well, look, yes, I had something there, and I do have something. I'm going to continue living the blessed life. Probably going to continue something on that next week in that same vein because we are living the blessed life, amen. But let me tell you, even though we're under attack, we're, we're blessed, amen. What's going on in the world, we're blessed, amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, I thank that, and I thank Brother Mark for being here. So he's going to share the word of the Lord with us. Let's get Brother Mark Hill a good warm welcome. Amen, Brother Mark. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, all the kind remarks. And, and even if you didn't believe in the clap, thank you for doing it. Appreciate that. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. We'll start with verse number 20, reading from the New King James Version. I want to say before I get started, I normally would just kind of ramble for a little bit, but I kind of feel like the Lord laid something on my heart, so I want to say before I get started, 
how much I thoroughly enjoyed that youth choir. That was absolutely amazing. And I appreciate Holly and, and Lana, did I say that right? All their effort and put into that. But I'm going to tell you, if you're 13 and up there trying to sing the part and somebody next to you trying to sing, I can't do that at 44. That was just amazing. And I, I just think that's awesome. Awesome. 2 Kings 13, verse number 20. <clears throat> then Elisha died, and they buried him, and the raiding bands from Moab raided the land in the spring of the year. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. Now the King James says it's a well. Elisha was buried in the bottom of a dry well. They, so they, they're, they're in a hurry. They drop him into this tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. I want to preach this morning for a few minutes on this thought, a perpetual miracle. A perpetual miracle. I'm not much into, into dramatics, but I do feel like the Lord has laid something specific on my heart. I'd like for you to reach over and take your neighbor by the hand. It does no good for God to give me a word and for me to deliver it if we do not receive and so I, want to, I, I just want you in your own way to pray with your neighbor and say, God, help me to receive what you have for me today. Can you do that right now, Lord? We thank you for the honor and privilege of being here. I'm asking God that you would touch us today. Help me to do a good job in a short time and help us to receive that which you have. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? You can be seated. How many of you love leftovers? Boy, I do. I love leftovers. One of the reasons I like leftovers is because most of the time leftovers taste better the second time than they do the first time. Because they sit in that refrigerator and all that seasoning and grease and butter and it congeals and becomes all one and then you pop it in the microwave, Caleb, and you, you heat it up to where it's going to burn your mouth and you take it out and all of that time and all of that seasoning I don't know about you, but I love beans and cornbread. And beans and cornbread are always better about the third or fourth day than they were the first day. Now, fried potatoes are not, because grease cold is not good no matter what you do. But beans and cornbread, or tea, if, if you make a pitcher of tea, we used to, I, I don't know where I come up with this saying, but I used to always tell my parents, I, I'd make a pitcher of tea and put it in the refrigerator, and I, I'd tell my dad, I'm going to let it get a bead on it. I don't know what that meant, but what it meant was it was going to sit there for a couple days. Because sometimes things are better the second time around, or the third time around, or, or the fourth time around. I, I don't get to eat at home a lot, but when I do, I always cook for at least four or five more people than that's there. Because I've got a bunch of little Tupperware containers in, in my little Lazy Susan in my cabinet. And I'm going to pull out them, Myra, I'm going to pull out them Tupperware, and I'm going to put a little bit in here and a little bit in there. And then some night about 11.30 when I'm working, I need, a little, I need a little something just to keep me going. Troy, I go down there and start going through the Tupperware. And I find that thing, and it, it tastes so good because it's as good the second or third time as it is the first. Elisha, I'm not going to preach the whole story, but Elisha was a servant to Elijah. And he asked for a double portion of the anointing or the blessing of Elijah. Elijah had seven major miracles in his life. And Elijah told Elisha, he said, if you see me when I go away, you can get what you ask for. And so we know how the chariot of fire come down and picked up Elijah. And Elisha came back. And the first thing he did was he took his, the mantle or the coat or the representation of the anointing. And he smote the water and, and it parted. And that was the first of the next 13 major miracles in Elisha's life. So he, Elijah had seven major miracles. And Elisha came and, and when he died, he had 13 major miracles so it would lead you to believe that maybe somehow somebody didn't know how to multiply by two they couldn't get the double portion down and Matt in my uh, ideology I would have been happy Joe with 13 
I, I could have said, okay, that, that's, that's good enough for government work. That's close enough to double to do it. But the Bible said Elisha died and they buried him in a well, a dry well. And so people that had nothing to do with Elisha, that had nothing to do with what God or what was going on, happened to be raiding through the country. And one of their parties was wounded and they were trying to take him back home and then he died and they see the people that they were fighting with coming up behind them and so uh, they decided they were just going to throw him in this empty well. We, we got to get rid of the body. We, we got to get rid of this baggage. And so the Bible said they lowered him down into the well not knowing it was a sepulcher or a graveside of Elisha. Now you just think, let's get out of the spiritual realm here for a second. And let's put ourselves in the shoes of these people that are going by. They climbed off their horse. Their buddy's dead. There's blood everywhere. You can see the enemy coming up behind them. They're in a hurry. And they drop the body down in this well. And as soon as the, bone, uh, of, of the body touched the bones of Elisha, <laughs> something was continued to be stored. In those bones. Because as soon as the body touched the bones of Elisha, the Bible said that he was immediately restored back to life. Now, I don't know about you, that's gonna freak me out a little bit. I've said my goodbyes. I love you, Joe. I've, I took your sword. I'm passing your watch off to your kids. We've got your horse, everything loaded up. It's a finality thing. We drop you down, and as soon as you hit, boom, you pop back up. Yes, they probably left him. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed. That word framed in the original means hung upon. We understand that the worlds were hung upon by nothing more than the word of God. Mm. He said, let there be light and there, and we still have. He said, let the waters be separated from the sea or from the dry land, and we still have oceans and dry land. He said, let there be out of the oceans, let every fish, let every bird, let every, let every creature, and we still have fish, birds, and creatures. Hebrews says, we know, we believe, we understand. We, we, we have an understanding that the worlds were framed or they were hung upon by the word of God. And today, still, they're still hanging on that word. Oh, hallelujah. They're still hanging on that word. They're still there. Let me share just a little bit with you. I'm not going to preach very long today. So if you're going to take a nap, you should start now because I'm about halfway through. We live in a, for the Gidry, we live in a finite world. We have parameters to our thinking. We have parameters to our checkbook. How many of you have a parameter to checkbook? That means there's a beginning and an end. It's not unlimited, is it? Just because you have checks left does not mean you have more money in the bank. I wish it worked that way. Our world, we get up and go to bed. Everything about us has a limit to it. We have a limit to how much food you can eat. You have a limit to how much gas you put in your car. You've got a limit to how many hours you're going to work. Everything about that, there's a limit to what it is. But everything about God is unlimited. Hallelujah. I said everything about God is unlimited. Let me explain a scripture to you. Hebrews 13 and 8, we quote it all the time, but we, we don't misquote it, but we misinterpret it. The Bible said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That was the writer, which we believe to be Paul, finite, or his limited vocabulary, trying to explain God. But God is not just yesterday. God is not just today. And God is not just tomorrow. God spans time. 
What that really was saying is God is still in yesterday. God is still in today. And God is still in tomorrow. Which explains why when he said, and the worlds were framed by the word of God, that word that come out of his mouth, it's still a perpetual thing and it's still going. And that's why the world is still spinning. Mm. In a minute, all this is going to get good. So we understand that God, God's still at the cross in the Red Sea. I can say that. I don't understand it, but I can say that. It's true. He, he lives outside of time. That's why he's from eternity to eternity, from no beginning to no end. So therefore, things that he does, says, decrees, or puts into plan or place, let's bring it home into your life, Angie, are still working. Mm. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, most of the time I'm pretty calm, tell a lot of jokes. And try to get out of here in 20 minutes. But this is not the normal Mark Hill. I'm going to get excited here in a minute. Because you see, when I understand, that's why Jeremiah 29 and 11 has such an impact, Emily, in our life. He said, for I know the plans that I have for you. They are good and not evil. And my design is to give you future and a hope. Just because you hit a bump in the road does not mean that God's plan is not working in your life. Just because you're struggling today with something within your spirit or your flesh or within humanity does not mean that that which God has preordained and spoken into your spirit is not still working and moving and having his way in your life. David is running from Saul he is scared to death David had somewhat of a roller coaster of a of an experience in life he goes from being no name which I preached about a couple times before to all of a sudden now becoming man if he was alive today he'd be trendy trending on Facebook and Twitter yeah he, he'd be what everybody was talking about 16 years old with a sling and a couple of rocks he displays a giant he goes from, from feeding sheep and playing a guitar to having praise for him down in the middle of, of, of Jerusalem. Wasn't called Jerusalem then, but that's what it was. And, and he has people writing songs about him. Saul has plain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David goes through all of this. But Saul, in his heart of hearts and jealousy and all that stuff, decides Desiree that he's going to kill him. And so he tries, he tries to kill him. He's after him. He's got the, the bandits after him. The cops are chasing him. And David has, has fleeing for his life. And I can only imagine the trauma and the turmoil and the emotions that David's going through. Have you ever gone through something you felt like you had it licked? And then all of a sudden it rears its ugly head up again? And you feel like, man, what I, it can be so devastating. Because you feel like that I, I, I got victory over this. And, and I, I got a healing over this. And, and I believe the Lord touched me in this. And then all of a sudden, in a matter of days, seconds, or minutes, here it comes again. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's oppression. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's something that you felt like for the last three months you've had victory. But all of a sudden you woke up yesterday on Saturday morning and that which you were that you thought you had deliverance from and victory over is staring you in the face and it seems bigger than ever. And so you're looking at it, and David's that way. He goes from the this real high, high to a real low, low. And in Paul, he goes back up to a high and he's down to a low. He got so bad that David even traded sides and went and lived with the Philistines for a while. Just messed up out of his mind. And David is running. And he hides out in the temple, the tabernacle. And he's hiding out in this tabernacle. And, and finally somebody makes a little noise. And he comes sheepishly out. And he looks at this, uh, at, the, at the high priest. And he said, man, he says, I, I need something to eat. I haven't eaten for days. I, and, and I'm scared for my life. And he said, I, I've got no weapon. I've got no way to protect myself. I, I've got nothing. He said, do you have anything to eat? And do you have any kind of a weapon here? And the high priest said, the only thing we got to eat here is the showbread. And that's against the law. 
oh my. And David said, there comes a time when my hunger supersedes the law. Make me a sandwich. <laughs> I wish I had time. I, I could preach like 100 messages today. I'm going to tell you right now, there's times in your life, I'll just give you a 30-second snippet. There's times in your life you need to get so hungry that your hunger supersedes what the norm is. Whether it's for God, whether it's for a move of God, whether it's for God to move in your life, there's got to be something that gets on the inside of you that says, I don't care what law I'm going to break. My hunger supersedes what the law says. And so they made him a sandwich out of showbread. And they said, is there any kind of weapon here? And the priest said, yes, we have one. And when he said this, Laquita, it brought something back into David's life. He said, we have the sword of Goliath wrapped in a linen ephod, which was a priestly garment. He said, we've got it wrapped in a linen ephod, whom thou slewest. And Matt, in the middle of his despair, in the middle of his depression, in the middle of his fear and feeling like that he was fixing to be dead by the hand of Saul, something came back to David. And he said, give that sword to me, for there is none like it. I'm here preaching to somebody today. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your struggle is. But if God has ever moved in your life before, we've got to go back and get a hold of a sword. Standing in a tabernacle, eating bread that was against the law, David grabs a hold of that sword. And Lana, he remembers that that time stops for a second. And he remembers as a 16-year-old boy standing on that hillside with Goliath, his stone sunken into the forehead of Goliath with a concussion. And a little bitty fella, the most theologians think he was about five foot six or five foot seven. So for those of you that are vertically challenged, David's your guy. David's standing on that. Alex, he's standing on that, on, on that hillside, playing it over in his mind again and again, holding that sword, reaching down. Here is the champion of the Philistines. This is the one that has, that has beat his people up, that has killed his family members, that has raped and pillaged across their land. And here's their champion. And he reaches a hold and grabs a sword that most theologians think is taller than he is. Goliath's sword was somewhere about six foot long and he grabbed that sword and slid it out of that scabbard as he heard it go and he grabbed old greasy Goliath's ugly old head and brought that sword down and cut off that head and then lifted it up and when he did something galvanized in his uh, companions and they come pouring over the rocks and something petrified in the souls of the Philistines and the Bible said they chased them from there to Ziklag which was three days away and slew through it all and David is standing in a temple in a tabernacle in fear for his life the very one who put him up to killing Goliath is now chasing him and David stands and when he grabs a hold of that sword something gets a hold of his spirit and he said give it to me there's nothing like it it's too big to carry it's too cumbersome to carry around but it reminds me Paul of what God did for me on a great day I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here to tell you Jesus is more than enough. And not only is he more than enough, we got some history behind us. A miracle, the word of God is perpetual. That means it just continues. Like when you sign up with ADT, it's perpetual. I've tried to get out of that contract five or six times and they have all these hidden dates in there. And I say, ma'am, I hate ADT. I'd love to get out of ADT. And she said, oh, sir, you missed. We have a perpetual contract. And on the 17th Tuesday of the 13th month of the 43rd year and the seventh son of the seventh son, you missed that date. And so now you're tied in for another 73,000 years. 
And I said, what you're saying to me, ma'am, is I'm stuck with you for the rest of my life. She said, oh, no, no, there's an end. You just need to pay. The, the Bible said that the word of God returns. And when it returns, it does not come back empty-handed. When he speaks something into your life, it's perpetual. It just keeps right on trucking. Just like that word that's holding the world up right now. Roman causing it to spin. And the sun come up today. And the moon's going to come up somewhere. That's all there by the word of God. When that same word, that same verbiage, that same thing that come out of God, that spoke into your life, it still happens. Still taking place. God's still working. Well, the Lord said... and. God spoke to me, and I felt like I was healed, and, and I, it's, still, it's still coming. It's still there. It's still taking place. But life happens. Anybody ever have life? Life happens. Life happens to me a lot. I will say this, life happens to you more a lot the broker you are. Anybody with me on that? You get an amen on that one? You got money in the bank, it's no big deal if the power goes flat, does it? Now you run over to Wally World and you give them a hundred bucks and you think, well, I just had a little two-hour deal. But if you're broke and there's no money to go to Wally World, life happens a little bit more, doesn't it? Life happens. You see, God speaks something in the infinite and we live in finite. God speaks something outside of time. God says, I'm going to heal you outside of time. And because it doesn't happen that very second or that very moment, our flesh and the devil and everything begins to happen. And before long, we've discredited and taken away the word that came from the Lord into our heart. I'm going to open a door for your ministry. I, I'm going to touch here. I'm, I, I'm going to give you a new job. I'm going to bless you financially. I'm going to touch your family. I, I, I'm, I'm going to touch your kids. I, I'm going to keep my hand of protection upon and, and God speaks outside of time, and yet we live inside of time. And life and circumstance happen to us all. And before long, we have put our promise up on a shelf. It's getting dusty. We've got it in the back closet. We've taken what God has spoken unto us, Holly, and we've, we've explained it away and justified it and said, well, maybe I didn't understand it or God didn't mean this or, or maybe he meant that. And we try to use our own brain of reasoning and we try to get it all out there. When really all we have to do is just hang on and trust his timing. Trust his timing. Naaman was an interesting chap we find in the scripture. In fact, Naaman is one of the 14 major miracles of Elisha. Naaman is not a Jew. He has not been raised worshiping God. He does not understand the covenant that God has with his people. He is a Syrian. In fact, his people have conquered the Israelites and have taken slaves, which was common in those days, and has brought them back. And he now has a young 13 or 14-year-old girl in his household who is a slave. Naaman, when we pick up on him, has contracted a disease called leprosy. Leprosy in that day and even today is a very, very horrible disease. It's highly contagious and literally your flesh just rots off your body. Many times you'll see, if you don't believe me, go home look it up on Google, you'll see people that sleep with banana leaves over their eyes because the leprosy is eating away their eyelids or it eats away their hands. And it's in biblical days or even in, in those days, what they would do was when you became a leper, you had to go live with other lepers. And if you got within 20 or 30 feet of someone, if you had leprosy, it was according to the ritual of that day, not just biblical, but the ritual of that day that you had to cry unclean. There was no hope for you. You literally, once you contracted leprosy, it was just a countdown to your death. That's all that could be happening. And it separated you from your family. It didn't make a difference who you were, how rich you were. It made no difference because it alienated you. And then now you're living 
with other lepers. Naaman had contracted leprosy. Frantic, wealthy, trying every doctor, has no clue what to do. Finally, his little Jewish servant girl speaks up and says, if you can get to my country and you can find the man of God, God can heal you. Naaman packs his bag, loads up his chariot, gets his servant, and they head off for Judah. He gets there, he finds the king, he said, I'm looking for the man of God. And the king said, I know right where he's at, and he's down by the river living in a house. And so Naaman goes down by the river, and he gets to the house, and Gehazi comes out, and he says, I'm here, said my, and he explains the whole story I just explained to you. I have leprosy, I've got a 13-year-old girl who works in my home. And she said, if I could get here, that you could pray to your God and your God could heal me. And I'm here. And I'm sure he's got the wheels all shined up and the horses are looking good. And he's got gifts piled up on the back of the trunk ready to hand out. And Gehazi goes back in and he <clears throat> talks to Elisha. Elisha never even comes out of the house. Doesn't even give enough respect to Naaman to come out and say something to him. And Gehazi says, hey, Elisha's busy. <laughs> He's on the 12th level Super Mario Kart and he can't quit. But if you'd like to be healed, here's what you go do. He said, you go down the River Jordan, which was in flood stage at this time. It, and I'm not being critical, but it would have looked a lot like the Vermillion Bayou. How dirty that always looked. That's what it looked like. Which is why it's called Vermillion, because it's red and dirty all the time. Hey, don't be correcting my English while I'm preaching. <laughs> Naaman gets all upset. Naaman gets mad. He said, we've got clean water I could have washed in my own country. There's, there's ten rivers within a hundred miles I could have went to. Why do I have to go to the filthy, dirty, stinking, rotten, flooded, smelly river? And his servant says, Get a grip, bub. You've come all this way. If he'd asked you to do something fat, fabulous, you'd have done it. Why don't we just go try it? Because if you go home without a healing, you're dead. <coughs> okay. So he goes. And knowing Naaman, he's probably muttering the whole time. First time he dips, he's just fussing. By the fifth or sixth time, he's probably got some Holy Ghost cussing going on. Mad. He's got leeches everywhere and muds in his eyes. He's got stuff in his ears. And it's filthy and it's stinky. And he goes down the seventh time, and Pastor Meshi comes up, and the Bible said not only was he healed, he was restored. Oh, my. That's a whole message right there. God not only stopped the leprosy, but replaced all the flesh that had been eaten away, and not only replaced it, but it's like baby skin now. It's like brand new. Oh, my. He comes up out of that water forgetting all the dirt and the bugs and everything else, and he's hooping and hollering and screaming and yelling. He jumps back in a chair, and they rush back to Elisha's house. And he wants to give all this stuff to Elisha. And he said, I've got this kind of raiment. And I've got this much silver. And I've got this much gold. And I've got horses. And I, whatever you want, you can have it all. I'll give you everything. We'll get a taxi cab back to where I'm going. Because he's so grateful. And Elisha said, no, nah, I, I don't think I want anything. He didn't do anything. All he was given order. That's all Elisha did. So how could he take credit for something he didn't do? And so Naaman, and this is what I'm preaching about right now. I've been preaching 30 minutes. I'm closing. This is what I'm preaching about. Naaman said to him, you can read it. He said, then suffer, this is the King James, Old English. God speaks in Old English sometimes. He said, suffer me two mule loads of bread. I've read that story a hundred times, but a couple of years ago in reading it, that just kind of jumped out at me. I thought, why? In the world, Naaman's trying to give everything. Elisha doesn't take anything. And then he asks for two mule loads, or two pack saddles of dirt. Why in the world would he want that? What, what would be the... You ever read something in the Bible that just doesn't make any sense? That was one of those days where it's like, what in the world? That's in the book of Exodus, Roma, when Israel has come out of Egypt 
and they're in the process of the law being written and the tabernacle being built. And God has a bigger plan for what's taking place than just what's right there with those two or three million Jews. And he gives them a promise. And he says this, he said, there's going to come a day when you're not going to be near the temple or can't see the tabernacle. There's going to come a time when you're going to be far removed from what you would consider your indicator or physical presence of God that you can do. You know, when you're in church service and, and the preacher's preaching and you're feeling good, you can believe God for anything, can't you? Well, yeah, I can walk on water. Sure. I believe God can, God can do, God can heal. It's all going. But God said, he told him, he said, Israel, I know there's going to come a time when that's not going to be the case. And he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, get two mule loads of dirt from the place of victory where you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt I showed up at and I was there to work on your behalf and he said if you'll carry that dirt around with you he said it may be a week it might be a month it may be 20 years but if you'll take that dirt Troy wherever you're at and dump out that dirt that testament mm, my, my from where I met you last and worked a miracle in your life and he said if you'll stand on top of that pile of dirt and you'll proclaim in a loud voice of what God did for you and what this represents. He said no matter where, and I'm paraphrasing, stay with me, this is not old English and it's not God. This is Mark Hill's interpretation. He said I'll show up wherever you're at and I'll meet you right there and there'll be another miracle take place. perpetual miracle Naaman I don't know how if we get to heaven he's there I'm going to ask this question because it doesn't make sense somehow Naaman figured that out somehow in his Google research in his Wikipedia page it told he found that out somehow and Naaman knew that going back to the land of his birth there was no man of God there and there may be another time <coughs> that he was going to need a miraculous move of the Lord. And so he decided to take something with him. As we stand today, I know several of you need, that's it. I want to believe you're so mesmerized by my preaching you just didn't realize what I said. As we stand here today, there are several people in this audience that need a touch of the Lord. You didn't come to church today just by accident and you're not here just trying to pass time, but you came because there's a circumstance or a situation or a healing that you need God to move in. And today, the Lord sent the chubby white guy by to tell you that if you can have a little gratitude and a memory the same spirit, the, Paul Romans said this, if the same spirit that dwelt in Christ that raised him from the dead dwell also in your mortal bodies, it will also quicken you. If we can remember where God has spoken to us last or touched our life last or ministered in our spirit last and we can dump out, not literally but figuratively, we can dump out some of that dirt and I can stand on that. It may not be an instantaneous healing, but there will be a solution that will take place in your life. If you're not struggling or battling, this is just a good message. But if you're struggling or battling, this is a lifeline. God, I'm tired of fighting sickness. God, you promised, you said this, you said, you said that. You said this. In about the year 2003, I was shopping and I found a shirt that I loved. It was bright yellow. I, I like bright colors. It was bright yellow, Pastor. Beautiful shirt. Gorgeous shirt. And I bought it. It was at a Goodwill. 
I'm not going to go in Goodwill and try on clothes. If I don't like it, I'll just get rid of the quarter that I paid for it. I bought this, Lindsay, I bought this beautiful, bright yellow shirt. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to wear this, I'm going to wear this shirt out. And I got home, and I tried that shirt on, and between what I looked at at the store, I must have got an infection or something and swelled up. Because the buttons could only talk to one another. There was no meeting going on, Ben. My wife, I told you you should have tried that on the store. I told you. I thought I, I would have bought that shirt if it had been this far apart. Because Emily, I had faith. Maybe not a lot, but I had faith I could lose. I took that shirt, I hung it in the back of my closet. Six years went by. Six years. Six long years. Every time we'd move, every time we'd go clean the closet out, my wife said, you, you going to get rid of that shirt? And I said, nope. Why? That, that's my yellow shirt. It was too bright. It looked, it looked like it had batteries. It was just brilliant, vivid. I put that on. You could see me coming a mile away. Six years later, I lost a few pounds. I forgot about the shirt. It was always there, but I, I forgot about it. It was hidden in the back of the closet behind all the coats and stuff. I lost a more than a few pounds. I went down from about 400 pounds to down about 260. And I found the shirt. And I pulled it out. And I thought, I'm going to try it on. Maybe the buttons are a little closer. It was too big. I lost so much weight I could fold it over like this. I wore it for a year. Too big. Why? Because it was something that I kept that as time went on, I shrunk. I didn't grow into it. I shrunk into it. I'm here preaching to somebody today in the best way I know how that God has spoken into your life. Be it a healing, be it a blessing, be it a promise, be it whatever it may be, God has spoken into your life. And you may have it hanging in the back of your closet with my yellow shirt. But I'm going to tell you today is the day to pull that back out. And if nothing else, Angie, we're going to remind the Lord, God, I still got this shirt. And you still said that you were going to bless me and you were going to enlarge my territory and you were going to do this and you were going to heal my body and I'm not going to fight this sickness anymore. I'm going to get it out and wave it to the Lord. Why? Because the miracle is perpetual. If he said it once, it's going to continue. I don't have any magic dust. I wish I did. I wish I'd come up here and lay hands on everybody and bingo, everything would happen. I can't promise you that if we pray for you today, it's going to happen instantaneously. But what I can promise you is this. He said, if God said it, it's still coming. It's still coming. It doesn't make a difference what anybody says. It does. All you got to do is get your dirt out. Dump it on the ground and say, God, I don't know if you're going to show up right now. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell the world that you're not a failure. And you're not a liar. And you are a healer. And you are a deliverer. And I've got history on my side. If you need the Lord to touch you today, I invite you to come stand around the front. We're going to have a word of prayer here. There are going to be people that pray with you. And if for nothing else, we're just going to tell the Lord, God, I still believe. God, I still have hope. God, I still believe that you're going to do what you said you were going to do. That I'm not going to die in this dilemma. Come on. If you're down here, just slip your hands up begin to talk to the Lord. Just tell him, God, I, I believe. I believe, Lord. Come on, tell him, I believe. Lord, you spoke to me once. You said I was healed. You spoke to me, and I believe it right now, God. I'm going to stand on that word. I refuse to be bound by this. I refuse to be wrapped up in this. God, it may not happen right this very second, but I'm telling you right now, I'm believing that a miracle is still coming my way, that the deliverance I'm looking for is still within my spirit and heading down my path. Come on, tell him. God, I believe right now. You're standing next to somebody. Put your hand on their back. Lay your hand on their shoulder. Let's agree together right now. 
Come on, this is not about me laying hands on you or somebody else. That's it. Let's agree right now. Come on, the Holy Ghost is doing the work in this place. God, I believe right now you said it, Lord. You promised you were going to move in my business. You promised you were going to move in my life. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, that's it. Come on, I receive it right now, Lord. In Jesus' name, I receive it right now, Lord. Oh, that's it. I believe it, God. You've never failed me. You've never failed me, Lord. I believe it. You've never failed me, God. I believe the word. I believe the word. In the name of Jesus. God, we speak healing right now, Lord. Oh, that's it. Oh, all right. In Jesus' name, let your healing Proverbs says this. It says, a living dog is better than a dead lion. That means the littlest chihuahua, which is a rat with long legs, is better than a dead lion. You know what that scripture is trying to say to us? Is if you have hope and life and you're alive, you have more power than intimidation of something that is dead. I challenge you, many of you come up here today because you had something you needed the Lord for. I challenge you, in your own way, I'm not trying to get you to shout or huck a buck or anything like that. But I challenge you as we close out this altar service, that you lift up your voice however you want to. And you just thank the Lord in advance. And you let them know that God, I have breath and therefore I believe. And I'm going to give you thanks in advance for what you're going to do. That you spoke. Can you do that right now? Come on, just lift up your voice. It's between you and God. However you want to do it. God, I thank you for healing. God, I thank you for deliverance. God, I thank you for touching my job. I thank you for putting a fence around my family. I thank you for raising a standard, God. That's it. It doesn't take emotion. It takes your lips. It takes the word being spoken out. I thank you for doing it. Come on, lift your hands and love him together right now. 